Hello everyone and welcome to another Rewind Review. In this video we are travelling back to a galaxy far far away to take a look at Star Wars Episode 2 Attack of the Clones. Released in 2002, the second instalment of the Star Wars prequel trilogy sees young Padwan Anakin Skywalker sharing a forbidden romance with Padme Amidala, while Obi-Wan Kenobi discovers a secret clone army created for the Jedi. Once again directed and co-written by George Lucas alongside screenwriter Jonathan Hales, Attack of the Clones stars Ewan McGregor, Natalie Portman, Hayden Christensen, Christopher Lee, Frank Oz, Samuel L. Jackson, Ian McDermott, Tamara Morrison, Daniel Logan, Anthony Daniels and Kenny Baker. Yes, we are continuing with the prequel trilogy of the Star Wars saga, the era that I grew up with. And this movie, out of all of the Star Wars movies that have been released over the years, is kind of special for me. Mainly because this was the first Star Wars movie that I ever got to see on the big screen. This was the first Star Wars movie that I got to see when it first released. And I remember being quite excited about this movie being released. I remember seeing a lot of the merchandise, a lot of the posters that were getting released, all the pictures of Count Dooku and Jango Fett and all the clones behind them, all the Jedi versions with Yoda and Mace Windu and all that and it just looked cool. Plus I was someone who did grow up with Cartoon Network so I did see a lot of the adverts for a lot of the toys that were getting released and things like the creatures and the ships and Anakin strikes back with his two lightsabers. I also remember getting home from school one day and on the sofa was a box and inside that box was this lovely present from my dad and it still works as well. Okay, not so much. So it was a big deal for me and I did have a good time at the cinema. It was such a different experience to anything that I'd really experienced with any of the other Star Wars movies before, which at that point in time, I had only ever primarily watched on either VHS or DVD. So it was really nice getting to revisit this movie and having some of those memories coming back to me. But obviously for this review, I am going into this movie with my modern mindset. And while there are things about this one that I do like and I did like when I was younger, I can't deny, and I've got to be completely honest here, this might be my least favourite movie within the Star Wars saga. The story this time around picks up 10 years after the events of Phantom Menace with Anakin Skywalker, now the Padawan learner of Jedi Knight Obi-Wan Kenobi. But when Padme Amidala, the Senator and former Queen of Naboo, becomes the target of an assassination attempt, Anakin is tasked with protecting her and Obi-Wan is sent to discover the mastermind behind the attacks. And while Anakin and Padme begin to form a forbidden romance on Padme's home world, Obi-Wan uncovers a trail that leads to a bounty hunter called Jango Fett, a mysterious former Jedi called Count Dooku and a secret facility creating an army of clones for the Jedi. There's a little bit more going on in this movie compared to The Phantom Menace with the story this time around splitting off into two stories that weave together. It's a little bit more complex too, especially for a movie that is generally geared towards younger viewers. And the reason why I'm saying that is because I was young when I first saw this movie. And I'll be honest, I didn't really understand everything that was going on in it. Case in point, there's a character that gets brought up in this movie called Master Cypher Diaz. And for a long time from when it is I did first watch this movie, I was convinced, for whatever reason, that Master Cypher Diaz was actually Qui-Gon Jinn. And the reason that I had for that is because that both Qui-Gon Jinn and Master Cypher Diaz are said to have been killed off 10 years prior to the events of this movie, so for me that just kind of connected the dots. But Qui-Gon Jinn and Master Cypher Diaz were two completely different characters, and there was nothing really in this movie to really sort of indicate that that was the case. I had to look into this to actually find that out, and of course the Clone Wars series as well. So we're all good now. Well, mostly. There's also a large portion of the story that does revolve around the politics within the Star Wars universe, and the division between both the Republic and the Separatists, and this brewing war that is slowly starting to build up between them. The only issue is we don't actually see any of the division at work, and a lot of it is really just kind of told to us. There's people in this movie, or people who are talked about in this movie, Movie that are supposedly leaving the Republic who are the ones who are in charge because Count Dooku is the one who is swaying them to join the Separatists. But the problem is we never actually see any of his speeches and we never actually hear anything that he does say. Which I do understand to some capacity because the Senate meetings and the politics was one of the things that a lot of people did complain about, including me, about the Phantom Menace. And I don't think there's going to be many kids who would actually want to sit through a load of political speeches. I mean, it doesn't stop politicians from acting like kids, but that's not really important right now. So I do understand the potential reasoning for why those scenes aren't actually featured in this movie. But considering this part of the plot is very important and very crucial to what will ultimately happen within the Star Wars universe, the actions that are taken within the political side in this story ultimately lead to both the beginning of the Clone Wars 
and the rise of the Empire. So I do think that we could have done with hearing and seeing more of what was going on. One thing I do actually quite like about this movie is that the movie does revolve around a mystery and the Jedi Knights that are featured in this movie kind of get portrayed almost like detectives. And the reason I like that is because it does feel quite different to what it is that we have gotten with other Star Wars movies. Attack of the Clones is a lot darker than some of the other Star Wars movies and a lot more serious as well, partly because it is dealing with an assassination attempt on Padme, but it's also sowing the seeds for Anakin's ultimate downfall towards the dark side. There is a little bit of me that does wonder if this is reactionary to the complaints about the comedy that was featured in Phantom Menace, which even George Lucas himself admitted that they went a little bit too far. The comedy is definitely toned down compared to The Phantom Menace, which I do understand because the story that this movie is trying to tell is quite dark overall, but at the same time you do lose a little bit of that fun and that energy that you would expect from a Star Wars film. There is some speckles of humour here and there, but most of the stuff that works for me is a number of lines of dialogue from Obi-Wan Kenobi all delivered very well by returning Ewan McGregor, including this scene. Wanna buy some death sticks? You don't want to sell me death sticks. I don't want to sell you death sticks. You want to go home and rethink your life. I want to go home and rethink my life. Now that's funny. The rest of the humour that is featured doesn't quite work for me and it can be quite childish. Like the sequence with 3PO in the droid factory and swapping heads with one of the battle droids. I mean I say childish but even as a child I just didn't find that sequence funny. It's supposed to be a very tense situation at this point in the Star Wars timeline where the threat of a war is edging closer as the story progresses but for me I just don't feel that tension. Partly because as I said we don't quite understand the origin of the conflict and at the same time the actual story itself does feel quite staged and quite controlled. And I'm not talking about Darth Sidious even though look I understand that the entire war, the entire Clone War itself, is just one gigantic chess game that Sidious is playing with himself in the same way that Dr. Eggman does at the beginning of Sonic 2 or Jerry's game from Pixar. But both he and Count Dooku need to sway and manipulate everything that's happening and that is the stuff that we don't really see. There's little hints here and there but it's not always obvious what it is that they're doing. Anyway, no, what it is that I'm referring to is the overall scripting and direction of this movie and that is a problem that all of the movies in the prequels do have. I even talked about this in my Phantom Menace review. It's where there's loads of situations or decisions or even lines of dialogue that just don't feel natural and are only happening just because it has to happen. The biggest offender for me is the romantic subplot between Anakin and Padme. I really do not buy into the relationship Anakin and Padme develop across this movie. The way it's all written, performed, staged and plays out to me just does not work. And look, I do understand that there is going to be some attraction between them. I mean, it is Hayden Christensen and Natalie Portman after all. Got nothing on Obi-Wan though, that is a specimen of a man. I can understand Anakin being awkward around her and being conflicted about how he feels, but for me it comes across more like Anakin is quite obsessive and he can be quite creepy around her as well. And Padme even openly says that he makes her feel uncomfortable. So her going from that to confessing that she is truly, madly, deeply in love with him, it just doesn't work and it doesn't feel natural either. I mean after all, who can possibly resist lines like this? You are in my very soul. Torment. And this classic! I don't like sand. It's coarse and rough and irritating. And it gets everywhere. And who can forget that memorable moment where he openly confesses that he massacres an entire village. And not just the men, but the women and the children too. Ooh, Padme, you are a lucky girl. Ah, oh, shall we talk about performances now? Let's get that out of the way. Continuing the trends from The Phantom Menace, the overall performances from a lot of the actors that are featured in this movie are not really that great. There's a lot of very flat performances with some big moments not always having the right sort of reaction and a lot of the line deliveries just don't sound realistic. Again, I think it's a combination of both the scripting and the overall direction. But once again, the overall use of ADR is a contributing factor and it can be quite noticeable in a few scenes. And I think that is one of the reasons why the line deliveries are a little bit off. I even remember you and McGregor talking actually quite recently about this where he was talking about the dialogue in episode two and he reckons that none of the original audio that was recorded on set has actually survived so I definitely think that that is the case. Speaking of Ewan McGregor, unanimously across the Star Wars fandom he is usually seen as one of the better aspects of the prequel trilogy and that is definitely the case with this one. His performance this time around I think is an improvement on his performance in The Phantom Menace. He seems more relaxed and at ease with the role, he's definitely having more fun and I do 
really like him in this one. In fact, there's a lot of new characters introduced in this one that I do like, including Jimmy Smith as Bail Organa, Jack Thompson as Cleeg Lars, with Joel Edgerton and Bonnie Pease as the younger Owen and Baru, Jay Lagaya as Captain Typho, and Ronald Falk as Dex, who I was convinced was going to be an antagonist. Seriously, how does he know so much about Camino? And why does he have such an evil laugh? <laughs> Maybe he's a distant cousin of Pong Krell. Who knows? It is nice seeing a lot of the returning characters like Anthony Daniels as C-3PO, Kenny Baker as R2-D2, Frank Oz as Yoda, even Ahmed Best as Jar Jar, and Andy Seacombe as Watto in small roles. It's also quite nice seeing some of the returning characters from The Phantom Menace actually getting actively involved in the plot this time around and actually having something to do and being up and active and actually doing stuff rather than just kind of sitting around and talking. And I am 100% referring to the Jedi in this. Like Mace Windu played by Samuel L. Jackson and his purple lightsaber because he just had to have one. I love that story. Back in The Phantom Menace, Mace Windu originally had a blue lightsaber and if you actually look at the merchandise that was released around the time for The Phantom Menace, all the stuff related to Mace Windu had him with a blue lightsaber or you could get his blue lightsaber instead as a toy. But Samuel L. Jackson kept insisting that he wanted a purple lightsaber purely because he wanted to be able to see himself in some of the battle sequences and he just kept pestering George Lucas until eventually George Lucas just caved and gave him one. To be fair, I can't picture Mace Windu with a blue lightsaber. He looks so much cooler with a purple one. Anyway, as for a number of the other returning characters, as I said, the performances do feel quite flat and a bit underwhelming overall. And unfortunately, that does include Natalie Portman once again as Padme. I do like that she is more involved with the story this time around and not just hiding behind decoys the entire time. But as I said, for an Oscar winning actress who normally is absolutely fantastic in most movies and is trying her best to do what she can with this role, the performance here is not great and that is disappointing. And when it comes to Hayden Christensen as Anakin Skywalker, it could be a bit better. Look, I'm not the first and I definitely won't be the last to say that this is not a good performance overall, especially for this role. There is a lot riding on this performance considering how prominent Anakin is in this movie and who he ultimately becomes. Look, Hayden Christensen seems like a really likeable and charismatic guy in real life and I love that he is still so passionate about this franchise. I even love the story about when he was offered the role and I think that if that charm and charisma were used in this as a counterpoint to the more impulsive reckless and teenage awkward angst, I think that that would have been a big improvement. I get that he's young and basically told he's both incredibly powerful and the chosen one, so he would be quite arrogant, but that needs to be built up and not just in outbursts. Prime example, look at how he's handled in the Clone Wars. I get that he is a few years older in the Clone Wars series, but you need to balance out those different qualities of Anakin Skywalker, both the good and the bad, because you not only need to be able to logically see that this character will one day become Darth Vader, but you also need to feel bad for him that that is ultimately going to be his destiny. Because this version of Anakin, I have a hard time seeing this interpretation of Anakin one day becoming Darth Vader. But again, a large part of the reason for that is the writing. Like Jake Lloyd in The Phantom Menace, I genuinely think it's unfair just how many people have just kind of dogpiled on Hayden Christensen's performance in this movie, considering that there are so many other more experienced and much more higher profile actors in this movie that are all giving either flat or very subpar performances. And as I said, there are several other contributing factors that hinder most of the actors and their performances. And I know what it is that a lot of these actors are capable of, and that's why it's disappointing. Yes, when it comes to Anakin Skywalker, the performance from Hayden Christensen is weak overall, but at the same time, I do think that he does improve in subsequent appearances. And I do think that in this movie, he does have a few good moments. And I've got to say that sequence with his mother in the Tusken Raiders tent is genuinely good. And that is one of his best performances in this series. And you do feel the emotions that he is. It's just annoying when we finally see Anakin Skywalker snap and he starts to massacre this entire village of Tusken Raiders and it just cuts away to a completely different scene. Don't do that, that's one of the best bits. Anyway, honestly, one of the best parts of the prequel trilogy is Ian McDiarmid as Chancellor Palpatine, and in no surprise to anyone, he is great once again here. I quite like how they show how manipulative he is and how he manages to move everything in his favour. Again, even though it does feel quite staged. But I really like seeing the contrast between his interactions with Anakin and Obi-Wan's interactions. Because most of Palpatine's interactions with Anakin really kind of big him up as much as possible. Palpatine constantly is praising him, saying that he foresees Anakin becoming the greatest of all Jedi. 
and contrast that with Obi-Wan, who is very much a mental figure for Anakin. He is his master. He is the one that Anakin is, is learning from Obi-Wan. There is much more of a brotherly bond between Obi-Wan and Anakin, even though Anakin does say that he does see Obi-Wan more as a father figure. I think that the brotherly bond was a much better direction for them to go in. I would have liked them to have done that a little bit more. I think that that could have been a little bit more prominent and actually have them be a bit more friendly towards each other. But I do like the contrast between how it is that Palpatine is with Anakin and Obi-Wan. And obviously because of the way that Obi-Wan does interact with Anakin, Anakin does kind of push back a little bit more and he does feel like Obi-Wan is kind of holding him back. So of course he does have a lot more resentment and anger towards him. And Anakin is falling for the manipulations of Palpatine and I like how that is built up across this movie and Revenge of the Sith. That whole part of the prequels to me is some really good stuff and I do think that, that is some of the stuff that is handled very well. And I do think that Palpatine as a character is one of the best aspects of not only this movie but the entire prequel trilogy as well. But Palpatine, even though he is secretly pulling the strings behind Behind everything that's going on. I mean, it's not really that secret, to be honest. He isn't really the main antagonist to this movie. Instead, this movie chooses to introduce and focus on several brand new and different villains. Obviously, the Trade Federation are back briefly in this movie, but that's really it for them in Attack of the Clones. But we also get introduced to the shape-shifting bounty hunter, Zan, played by Liana Walsman, who I always thought was kind of cool, considering she's only got a small part in this film. Plus, we also get to meet Django Fett, played by the effortlessly awesome Tamara Morrison, who is another bounty hunter in Mandalorian armor and the father of Boba Fett here played by Daniel Logan. He is easily my favorite character from Attack of the Clones. He looks cool, he sounds cool and he gets one of the best looking fight sequences of the entire film. And I love that not only was Tamara cast but the decision to make Jango Fett the original template for both Boba Fett and the entire clone army because Tamara is good and it means that this isn't just a one-off appearance and we do get to see him return any time a live action clone is needed. But there's one other character that makes an appearance in this movie that doesn't really have that much screen time. In fact, the first time he shows up in this movie is about 75 minutes of the way through and he's played by an absolute legend. And that, of course, is Christopher Lee as Count Dooku. Count Dooku, for all intents and purposes, is the main villain of this movie. And with Christopher Lee's performance, he has an excellent presence backed up by his signature look of superiority whenever he's on screen. I had to mention that somewhere. But while Dooku does have some really interesting aspects, like his connection to Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan, and the fact that he used to be a respected Jedi, I do think that they could have done a bit more with him. Plus, there's a lot of plot points and big reveals that are either skimmed over or just implied. Like the mystery surrounding Master Sifo Dyas and who it was who erases all the data on Kamino in the Jedi archives. It's all Dooku, but it never actually gets addressed in the film. It does in the animated shows, but that was years later. I do like his talk with Obi-Wan at one point in the movie, and you do kind of see a little bit of his mindset when it comes to not only the Jedi, but the Sith as well. But that's pretty much all we really see of him and his character. To be honest, the only time Dooku who really gets explored further is in Tales of the Jedi, which managed to make him one of the most interesting and sympathetic characters in the Star Wars galaxy. It's really worth a look if you have never seen it. The animated TV shows have honestly done wonders for many of the major characters in this series, including Obi-Wan and Anakin. And some of the stories that are told in the animated shows honestly are some of the best Star Wars stories since the originals. That's how good they are. If you have never seen any of the animated TV shows, please go and see them. They're all on Disney Plus. Go and do it. You will not regret it. Anyway, but yeah, I do like Dooku overall. I love Christopher Lee, but they definitely could have done a lot more with him, especially his connection to Obi-Wan, which if done right, could be one of the most interesting aspects about this movie. And that is what I feel like a lot of the characters in this movie do kind of feel like overall. There's lots of cool and interesting ideas and concepts, but a lot of it is not properly explored. What is explored in this movie though, is the galaxy. This is one of the aspects of the prequels that I think rivals the original trilogy because each movie introduces us to a number of new planets and locations. Obviously, Coruscant is still the central world again like The Phantom Menace, but it features much more prominently here. And we do get to see a bit more of it this time around, like the streets, a few bars and Dex's diner. Plus, we also get to see a bit more of the Jedi Temple, including the training room and the Jedi archives. The Jedi Temple looks amazing. We also get to return to Naboo to see more of the countryside and lakes where Padme reenacts the sound of music and the origins of that infamous meme. The meme that doesn't actually play out in the same way that the actual scene does. Anyway, as is tradition, we also get introduced to two brand new worlds in Attack of the Clones. 
Bones. The first one might be one of my favourite new additions to the franchise as a whole, and that's a planet called Kamino, the homeworld of the clones. It looks incredible, and the detail that's gone into making it look both believable and mysterious is amazing. Plus, it acts as a really moody backdrop to, in my opinion, the best fight of the entire movie. It's also really cool seeing the cloning facility and how the Kaminoans grow them and the training that they go through. Obviously, that's explored a little bit further in both the Clone Wars and the Bad Batch, but it is really fun seeing them not only being introduced here, but you kind of see their origins here as well. Plus, the fact that they do go out their way to mention that the clones have been engineered to follow orders, you know, good soldiers follow orders. That is a really nice little set up and a little bit of foreshadowing to what it is that will ultimately happen in Revenge of the Sith. The final planet that's introduced, there's not really a lot for me to really talk about. Geonosis is the homeworld of the droid factories, that's where all the droids get created before they go out to battle, and it's where the final battle of this movie takes place. It looks a little bit more rockier and more lived in than Tatooine does, which also appears in this movie, but it is basically just another desert planet. To be fair, I do really like a lot of the designs and the sculptures on this world, and I appreciate that the actual places the characters visit do look pretty unique, and that also definitely applies to the asteroid field sequence which honestly looks incredible. I genuinely love the looks and designs of each location, they all feel unique and offer a lot of visual variety, and I do really appreciate that this film does still have some actual locations that are honestly stunning as opposed to just completely green screen environments, of which this has many. To be fair, the design aspect of these movies has always been one of my favourite parts of the prequel trilogy, and not just when it comes to the planets, it's the ships, it's the aliens, it's the creatures, it's the droids, and the many, many many costumes most of which belong to Padme. Seriously, she seems to have a different costume on in pretty much every single scene. Anyway, most of the things that appear in this do look very unique, like the aliens, like the ships, like the props, and everything does feel quite tangible, everything does feel quite believable. And the reason for that is because everything does have a reason for looking the way that it does, either where it's from or who it's made by. Especially when it comes to a lot of the starships, because not only do they all need to feel quite unique and very distinct from each other, some of them do need to look like they echo things that are going to appear in the future. Some of the ships that appear in this movie are going to eventually evolve into the ships that we see in the original trilogy. Plus, there's a really subtle thing that they do with both the droids and the clones, and that's just when it comes to the actual designs, like more so in the helmet shapes and designs that they've actually got for them. Because both of them look very similar to their creators. Obviously, the clones look like the Kaminoans and the droids look like the Genosians. That is very cool and it is really well thought out. There is genuinely a lot of imagination and creativity that has gone into making this, and I honestly love what they have been able to make. I want to say there's some creativity in some of the action sequences and a lot of the larger set pieces, but I am a bit split on that, to be honest. The action, generally overall, is fun and pretty lively, and these are some of the most entertaining scenes for me. But the issue that I have is that there's a lack of tension, and the staging and choreography is underwhelming. It never feels like anyone is in danger, even during the arena battle, where you've got these genuinely scary-looking beasts being unleashed on the main characters. It never feels like there's any threat. Even the final fight between Dooku, Obi-Wan, and Anakin, that is a huge step down from the Darth Maul fight, and kind of comes across as a bit boring. How it ends is a bit of a shock, but that doesn't take away from just how slow the choreography is. And there's even a little bit where George Lucas goes all sort of artsy, and rather than actually like swinging around, actually like trying to parry in and clashing with each other, it's just them just in silhouetted darkness, just swinging the lightsabers around in front of them, like they're not even like attacking each other at all. It's just like, I don't understand what's going on. And the problem is, there's actually a deleted scene that actually shows an extended fight sequence between Anakin and Dooku, and it's genuinely amazing. Why was it cut? Anyway, as I said, there are some fun sequences like the opening chase through Coruscant, the Jango Fett fights and the asteroid sequence, the video game-esque sequence in the droid factory, which is kind of funny to me, but it is a strange sequence overall, plus the whole final battle between the clone and droid armies, which has one of my favourite shots of the entire film and sees the clones being engulfed in a dust cloud and just blindly shooting into the sand. That looks incredible! And I can't deny that I did feel a bit giddy the first time that I saw the scene where all the Jedi, Plo Koon, Luminara, Kit Fistu, Aayla Secura, Shock T, Ki Adi Mundi, all ignite their lightsabers and race into the battle against the droids. I do still admittedly get a little bit of a buzz from that sequence, it is pretty cool overall. Plus, I will admit, I do kind of have a bit of a soft spot for the Yoda and Dooku fight. It makes absolutely no sense, especially since we've never seen Yoda this active before. Ever. But it is still fun, even if Yoda has lost a little bit of that Frank Oz magic by moving completely to being a CG creation this time. And unfortunately, the CG is a little bit wonky. Yeah, for how good some of the makeup and effects in these movies can actually be, the overall CG effects in this movie 
are a bit mixed. Some stuff that is featured in this movie I don't think looks too bad overall. I do think that there are some things that do still hold up, especially when it comes to the overall detail and design of everything. But there are definitely a load of effects in this movie that have aged and don't look that great. The green screen is probably the worst offender for me just because of how prominent it is. It's not awful by any means and in comparison to a lot of the other CG heavy movies around the time it is okay but it is noticeable in several scenes. As I said I do like that there are some real locations and there is a good mix of the two types of environments but it is harder to suspend your disbelief when it doesn't look like some of these places are even real. But when it comes to the sound design that is where this movie really excels. Star Wars always has some really impressive sound effects and Attack of the Clones is no different. From the opening sequence all the way through to the very end, the sound design of this movie is both atmospheric and very immersive. As I said, this was the first Star Wars movie that I saw in the cinema and that's one of the first things that I really did take notice of, the sound design, which was absolutely incredible and it's one of the reasons why I really did enjoy the experience of this movie on the big screen. It is genuinely, once again, Game absolutely incredible and it really does help bring this universe to life. Plus, I cannot do this video and not mention one very specific sound and the fans know exactly what it is that I'm talking about. Viewers, may I present to you the greatest sound effect in all of cinema. That, my friends, is called a seismic charge and it is one of the greatest sounds I have ever heard in my entire life. One more time. So yeah, the sound design's great. Equally great once again is the soundtrack by John Williams. John Williams, reliable as ever, has created a fantastic soundtrack that elevates every single sequence that it is used in. It heightens the tension, the drama and the emotion and it helps them land a lot better than it would if there was no soundtrack at all. Never underestimate the power of a good soundtrack. I also really like how it is that John Williams actually weaves in a load of the themes from some of the older movies and it does help this movie feel a little bit more connected to some of the other films. Even though I will admit some of the older themes like the Imperial March for instance in the scene that it is used in to me just doesn't feel earned in that moment it feels like it is crowbarred into that sequence it just doesn't work with that scene but I'm being nitpicky I love the romance theme I love Django Fett's theme and I love the theme that they use during the arena battle that might be my favorite bit and I love that it gets used again in Revenge of the Sith the soundtrack is absolutely amazing and the movie as a whole would be so much worse off without it overall Look, I can't pretend that this is a great film and I can't say that this is a favourite of mine either. I like some things about it like the casting, the new characters, some of the effects and a few of the set pieces. I love the sound design, the music from John Williams and the designs and art of the planets, vehicles and aliens. But the performances, outside of a few moments, are quite flat and staged. The story and subplots feel quite controlled and not very organic. The rest of the effects can be 50-50, especially anything involving green screen. And there is a significant lack of tension or escalation that this film really needs. This could have been an amazing thriller set within the Star Wars universe. Attack of the Clones had so much potential and has so much going for it, but the overall story and the execution of it just doesn't work as well as it should. And that to me is the most disappointing thing. I really don't know if I could recommend this movie to casual viewers. There's so much better Star Wars content out there that is definitely worth your time. But for Star Wars fans, I would still say this is worth seeing, more so because this is an important chapter in the Star Wars saga and there are some cool things in it. But I definitely wouldn't say that this is a must watch and unfortunately this is one of the weakest entries in the franchise. And personally, it's my least favourite of the live action entries. So with all that being said, my rating for Star Wars Episode 2 Attack of the Clones is a 5 out of 10. Look, I do understand that this movie does have its fans and if you are somebody who really does enjoy this movie, then that's great. Everything that I'm saying in this video is just my opinion. These are just my thoughts and feelings on this movie overall. You do not have to agree or disagree one way or another. That is completely fine. But the one thing I think we can all agree on, seismic charges rule. <laughs> Well, I think that is pretty much everything I want to say for this video. So if you have watched this video, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoy this content, please like and subscribe and be sure to hit the notification button to keep up to date on everything that's going on on here. If you have seen episode two, Attack of the Clones, let me know down in the comments what you think about it. Plus, if you have any suggestions for any future rewind reviews you would like to see me do, let me know down below. But until next time, thank you very much for watching and may the force be with you.